So I'm sure everyone will be very relieved, uh, me especially, that I'm not going to speak about purple tomatoes today. I'm going to talk about uh, another coloured fruit, uh, blood oranges. And uh, this gives me the opportunity to demonstrate certain things. Firstly, um, the diversity of research that goes on in the UK, though I think uh, my group is the only group working on citrus in the UK. It has some disadvantages in trying to cultivate it here. Um, also, uh, the, the, um, the real insight, fundamental insight that you can get actually derived from looking at applied problems. So I'll try and uh, make that point again at the, at the end of my talk. And the other thing I want to uh, do by... Uh, presenting this talk is to illustrate that we don't have to fight with medical people in order to get a hold of some of their money. Actually, working with them is quite a good way of uh, releasing some of those medical funds because plants can really make a big difference to uh, medical outcomes. So I'm, I'm one of the five or seven a day people, so I believe very strongly in the uh, that, uh, high levels of plants uh, in your food are really good for you. So I'm going to start with this picture, which is from Bartolomeo Bimbi, uh, and it shows probably the first uh, depiction of a Sicilian blood orange, uh, which is down here. Unfortunately, uh, this picture, uh, which is from the Medici collection of weird and wonderful citrus forms uh, from 1715, uh, the, the, there are numbers on here relating, which give names to some of these mutants, mostly the citron mutants, but this one is numbered, but with no name. So we don't know definitively, but it looks pretty red to me. And uh, so how did we come to, how do I come to be interested in uh, Sicilian blood oranges? Uh, and also how do I come to be interested in the biotechnological opportunities that can come from the understanding them at a fundamental level? Well, this started about eight years ago with a, European Union project that I was funded to coordinate, uh, where we were looking at essentially uh, the effects of different compounds, perhaps we could call them phytonutrients, that accumulate in certain foods. And we were looking for matched pairs that were isogenic foods, if you like. So uh, the blood orange is a perfect example. It has high levels of anthocyanins in the flesh of the fruit, and this can, can be compared to the regular blonde orange. And it had been known for, I mean, I was told when I was a kid that blood oranges are really healthy for you, and there's a tradition, particularly in it Italy, that they are healthy. But uh, there had really been very little uh, fundamental research on this. But this seemed like a perfect matched food that you could actually investigate whether blood oranges were healthier for you. They differ uh, in the, a little bit in their pH, but the main difference is in the content of anthocyanins. There are no anthocyanins in blood oranges, in blonde oranges, but there are quite significant levels in blonde oranges. There are also some differences in the flavanones, uh, flavanone content of the oranges. So the experiment started uh, in Milan uh, with our collaborators, Marco Giorgio and Lucia Letitta, who took regular laboratory mice and fed them on a high-fat diet. And uh, they then intervened with different beverages. So they either gave them a water beverage or a blonde uh, orange juice beverage, uh, this is navalina or navel orange juice, or a blood orange juice beverage. And they looked at the weight gain that the animals made. And these are significant numbers of animals. And the, on a water beverage, uh, mice piled on the grams uh, in much the way as humans pile on the grams or the pounds uh, on a high fat diet. So you can see that they increased in weight. The blonde orange juice beverage uh, actually resulted in a slightly lower uh, weight increase, which is quite significant in, in, or interesting because of the sugar content that's actually uh, present in, in orange juice. But more remarkable still was the fact that the increment in weight gain uh, with animals fed solely a blood orange juice beverage was really very small, so that the consumption of blood orange juice really... Um, more or less eliminated the gain in weight that was normal uh, if you, uh, yeah, on a high fat diet. And this was uh, followed up uh, post mortem by an examination of where the differences in weight were. And it turned out to be in these difficult fat bits for women, at least, uh, that, that come on your legs and around your tummy. 
Uh, and uh, this is called the uh, white fat uh, here. And you can see um, this, this is uh, adipose tissue from animals on the uh, water uh, beverage diet. And you can see big uh, adipocytes really full of fat. Similarly, on the blonde orange juice beverage, they were big adipocytes. But the adipocytes uh, in the white fat of the animals on the blood orange juice beverage were much smaller. And this uh, mirrored uh, or confirmed data that had been uh, demonstrated from adipocyte cultures where purified anthocyanins had been added to the culture medium. So it seems that even in an in vivo model, you can inhibit adipocyte and white fat development uh, with the anthocyanins. Uh, and it, quite remarkably, the uh, weight of the uh, white fat on the blood orange juice beverage was one quarter of that on the um, water or on blonde orange juice uh, beverages. So uh, there's been quite a lot of uh, further study of this. I just present this as some markers. Uh, this was a, from further publications uh, uh, looking at the effect of blood orange juice on fatty liver disease, which is becoming more and more important. And it shows that the combination of the high fat diet plus the blood orange juice in comparison to water ob obviously recapitulates this uh, lower weight gain and it's pretty much the same weight gain on a, as on a standard diet, um, the, or body weight as on a standard diet. And uh, this is serum cholesterol, so that's also lowered. Uh, and uh, these are serum uh, tri triglycerides uh, here. And this is another marker for cardiovascular risk factor. So a number of markers show that consumption of blood orange juice, I mean, it is the sole beverage that these animals have, in combination with a high uh, fat diet abrogates the effects of, uh, of the high-fat diet on obesity. Um, one other really fascinating piece of information, which hasn't been published, but I think this is just great. Uh, if you feed an animal a, a high-fat diet and then stop the high-fat diet, put it back onto the standard diet, that's kind of like a washout period, and then you have what you also see in humans, if you put them back onto the high-fat diet, you have a much more rapid increase in weight. And this is called the yo-yo effect, and I'm sure some people who've gone on crash diets know about this, uh, that if you stop dieting, then uh, you pile on the pounds uh, uh, more quickly. However, if during the washout period on the standard diet, you consume blood or the animals consume blood orange juice, then the rise in weight gain when put back onto the uh, blood orange juice uh, is, remains uh, a, a little bit, actually a little bit lower than the original gain in weight. So uh, there's a memory of consuming <coughs> blood orange juice, which I think is, so, and implies that there may be some effects of the anthocyanins in this diet uh, on epigenetic factors controlling weight gain. So I can't give any better explanation for it than that, but it's just amazing. So I've told you about the effects in animals, but everyone says, oh, what about the effects in humans? And uh, we've done some studies on uh, humans, uh, some studies on healthy humans were not really uh, very conclusive, but uh, a chronic randomized crossover study on blonde and blood orange juice, so this is short term, uh, had an effect of that the intake of blood orange juice but not blonde orange juice, redu reduced platelet activation, which is the predisposition for your uh, blood platelets to clot. And that's obviously uh, a beneficial uh, effect in, t in terms of predisposition to stroke. But it was only in smoking subjects. And the conclusions from this was that actually smoking subject, people who smoke are probably more at risk of cardiovascular disease. I should mention here, that you can only do these short-term studies looking at cardiovascular risk factors. It's really very difficult with short-term funding uh, and with the markers to look at obesity uh, gains in humans. So um, they then moved uh, to a study on uh, cardiovascular risk in patients that were at risk. So this is a pilot study, but I think it's uh, quite interesting. The pet, the, uh, they, they used 18 patients, uh, or subjects, let's call them subjects, they're not actually sick, uh, men and women split equally, uh, and their major uh, at-risk factor was this high LDL, so high, de uh, high levels of low-density lipid in the plasma uh, compared to normal subjects. But they were sort of on the margin, with BMI of 26.8, so that's just over the overweight line. 
So not, not seriously at risk, but uh, some markers that were high. And then they were given what's called, techni the technical term for this is an oxidative stress, but it's a full English breakfast. And if anyone is uh, <laughs> interested in the recipe, there it is. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, fat, it's a fatty meal. So, and to accompany uh, this, fatty, uh, this oxidative stress, they had one beverage, so just one shot. Of, and they had either 500 millilitres of water, 500 millilitres of blonde orange juice, or 500 millilitres of blood orange juice. And I'm going to give you some data here. It's quite a difficult table to work through. But the results show that in terms of blood glucose levels, both the blonde and the blood orange juice uh, lowered the rise in or, or the high level of uh, blood glucose, or reduce the level of blood glucose uh, three hours after the uh, fatty meal. There's a, an increase in triglycerides in the plasma that occurs, uh, quite significant increase um, as a result of all the fats that people have eaten. And the blonde orange juice didn't have much impact on that, but the blood orange juice uh, resulted, consumption of the blood orange juice resulted in a significantly lower uh, level rise in uh, triglycerides. There were also effects on the white blood cell count, but these were shared by blonde and blood orange juice. So bottom line here is drinking blood, uh, orange juice is quite good for you, but drinking blood orange juice is better because you don't get the rise in triglycerides. And there's also effects on arterial stiffness, so the, the arteries are not so stiff, and uh, platelet aggregation. So again, the uh, effects were observed in at-risk patients after just one juice of, uh, drink of juice uh, that uh, they were not so, uh, there was, the risk factors for stroke were not so high. Okay, so at this point, you're probably all thinking, well, I must get some of that more blood orange juice. <laughs> uh, and um, you might get some now. In a week or two's time, you won't be able to get any blood oranges. You might get some Tropicana Sanguinello uh, orange juice, blood orange juice for another month or so. But there's a lot of problems with the supply of blood orange juice. They're much less, uh, or blood oranges, they're much less available than when I was a kid. And one of the major reasons is because um, the, re the, the reliable area for cultivation is uh, this area in Sicily. Uh, and that is because to get full pigmentation of the oranges, you need um, strong day-night thermal climbs in, in temperature. And really, on this side of Mount Etna is the most reliable place to get it. And so they do cultivate blood oranges in other parts of Europe, for example, in Spain. But quite often, they lose the entire crop because it doesn't get cold enough, uh, particularly at the night times. And just to demonstrate this, I've um, I bought some what are called blush oranges in Waitrose. And I put uh, well, I kept some of them outside. And uh, this is, you can, if you come close, this is the uh, blood orange, but this is at the normal temperature. And then I used a trick of the trade and put the other half in my uh, refrigerator for a week. And you can see how much more color there is in this one. So the color production is very dependent on cold. And this means that in the major orange juice producing areas of uh, Brazil and Florida, uh, it's not possible to cultivate blood oranges. So. The supply is dependent on the Italian sources of uh, or blood oranges, and uh, these are somewhat unreliable and, um, yeah, quite limited. So if we want to have healthy people, maybe a good idea would be to find out why blood oranges are bloody, and uh, also to maybe think about expanding the range in which they could be cultivated. There are some other problems with uh, blood oranges. They have a slightly different taste. They're not as sweet, or they don't taste as sweet. Uh, they have many seeds, so they're not uh, uh, like a navel orange, which doesn't have seeds. So, and uh, they're not easy peeling, which means that people don't really like to uh, buy them for, as fresh oranges. Uh, but they do have quite a, a good potential as juice. So we wanted to understand uh, why blood oranges are bloody. And of course, with my background, uh, the MIB transcription factors were known to activate the anthocyanin pathway. And the activity of a MIB transcription factor will turn on the, product, uh, the uh, synthesis of all of the enzymes that are required to make anthocyanins, which are shown down here, plus the transporters that will transport them into the vacuole for storage. 
So it seemed likely that the difference between a blood orange and a, a blonde orange was maybe the activity of a MIB transcription factor. And uh, you can't really see this, but it's uh, absolutely unnecessary to see it by using uh, degenerate oligos. Uh, Eugenia Butelli in my lab was able to uh, amplify from the flesh of blood oranges a MIB transcription factor uh, that uh, aligns here in this clade of MIB transcription factors, all of which are known uh, to, um, to regulate uh, anthocyanin biosynthesis in dicotyledonous species. He called it ruby, uh, and that's because uh, he's Italian and he wanted to commemorate one of uh, Silvio Berlusconi's girlfriends. <laughs> uh, we have other genes with other names of uh, girlfriends. But uh, yeah, OK, let's press on here. Uh, <laughs> So um, just to a functional test, we transformed it into tobacco. Tobacco in vegetative tissues doesn't normally produce anthocyanins. When you express it under the control of the 35S promoter, then you get anthocyanin production in the transformed callus, and you can regenerate these nice little plants that make anthocyanins. So it's definitely a, uh, a, a, a regulator of anthocyanin production. And uh, we were interested, of course, in the difference between blood and uh, blonde oranges. Uh, so looking at the uh, five prime region of the gene, this is the ruby gene here, we found in blonde oranges that there was exactly the same uh, sequence uh, that could be identified from genomic DNA, but we were unable to detect using these oligos, we were unable to amplify a band that corresponded to the upstream region. And that's shown here. This is the band that's uh, amplified with specific oligos uh, from the uh, five prime, or yeah, from the five prime end of the gene from the ATG uh, and an upstream oligo. And this is non-specific amplification from the blood orange, uh, from the blonde orange. So this uh, suggested that this might be a specific marker for blood oranges. And <clears throat> we had uh, accessible to us through our uh, collaborators in Italy this complete uh, range of uh, different uh, blood orange varieties. And so we checked uh, a very large number of accessions to see whether the markers always picked out the blood oranges. And uh, this is just uh, shows that a band here, which is sometimes fainter because of the quality of the PCR, but in blood oranges, it's always amplified and it's always missing in the uh, blonde oranges. So it looked like uh, we had a good marker for uh, blood orange. And also, the, there was a suggestion that all of the blood oranges were due to the same mutation. Just to show how good this marker was, uh, Eugenio went down to Waitrose and bought some mock uh, blood orange juice, which was actually orange and mango, and also compared it to this uh, superior uh, uh, sanguinello uh, orange juice from Tropicana, uh, amplified either by preparing DNA from the juice or directly from doing PCR on the juice. <laughs> and there you are, you can see there's a band in both the juice and the DNA uh, from the sanguinello, but not from the orange and mango. So it's uh, quite a good quality control uh, marker. And now people are using, in the citrus industry, people are using uh, this marker to breed blood mandarins because mandarins are a true species uh, of citrus. And so you can do proper segregation and breeding and you can introduce by a cross the blood orange uh, trait from blood oranges and then try and get out uh, pigmented fruit mandarins. Uh, this just shows that the expression of ruby is tightly correlated uh, to the amount of anthocyanin that's present in the uh, fruit. So I, I just have to step back a moment and uh, just tell you something about the genetics of citrus, which is, well, pretty non-existent, really, because most of the citrus uh, varieties that are familiar to us are interspecific hybrids. And sweet orange is an interspecific hybrid between mandarin and pomelo, uh, which are uh, true spe species. And uh, so that gave rise to sweet and sour orange and also grapefruit. And uh, sweet orange uh, never propagates uh, uh, sexually. It's only propagated by grafting or by the apomictic seed. So they're always vegetatively propagated. So it's a, a, a sort of frozen in specific hybrid. So in order to understand at the molecular level the blood orange trait, we had to first genotype uh, the ruby gene in both mandarin and pomelo. 
And in Mandarin, uh, there were two alleles, both of which are non-functional. One has a stop codon in the predicted open reading frame, and the other has a large deletion taking out the first two exons. So uh, that's why mandarins never have any pigmentation in them. And uh, Pumelo uh, had a, has a number of different uh, alleles, uh, but um, the one, one particular one, which I show up here, uh, has a mutation, so it has a, a, a complete, it codes a p complete open reading frame, which should be functional, but it has a mutation in a tatter box here, so that uh, it may not be functional. Now, looking at sweet orange, uh, the genotype of that was it inherited the deletion allele from uh, mandarin, shown down here, and it inherited the uh, functional allele of uh, ruby from pumelo, but the one with the mutated tatter box. And that probably explains why sweet orange is never pigmented, except in blood oranges. So, what happens in blood oranges? Well, we found that in the ruby gene, there was an insertion just upstream of <coughs> the uh, ATG, and that this was a 5.5 kilobase uh, retrotransposon, and it's an active retrotransposon. And that means that within the long terminal repeats of the retro element, there is a promoter which drives the expression of the uh, retro element, and uh, it also provides a tatter box which then uh, replaces uh, the, uh, well, it substitutes for the lost one. So in Morrow, uh, what you see is that there is a transcript that's produced, for, driven by the tatter box in the LTR, the downstream LTR, and that this uh, sequence is then spliced out to form an untranslated leader that then goes into the uh, coding sequence. So that's what happens in Morrow. <clears throat> but interestingly, if you also look at other varieties of blood orange, you see that it happens in Tarocco and in an ancient uh, blood orange variety called Doppio Sanguigno, uh, so it looks like all Italian uh, blood oranges are actually the same event and that the differences in pigmentation are due to second site uh, variation. So what about the problem with the supply of sanguinello? I said it was very dependent on cold. One of our ideas was that it was actually the retro element itself uh, that uh, was, giving, was conferring the cold dependency of anthocyanin production. And so... Uh, we thought we wanted to test whether the expression of the retro element was cold sensitive. And the way that we did this was simply by measuring, doing quantitative PCR, measuring transcripts arising from the long terminal repeat, the promoter of the retro element, uh, from the gag pole region here, and comparing it to expression of the ruby gene under uh, in oranges that had been picked but stored at room temperature compared to those that had been stored at, at four degrees for a, a while. And you can see that uh, ruby expression is induced by the cold in different blood orange varieties, and so is the expression through the LTR of the retro element and also through the gag pole region, and this results in an induced level of anthocyanins in the uh, fruit. So it seems like the cold dependency is absolutely dependent on <coughs> the uh, controlled expression of the retro element. So one way to solve the problem would be of the supply of sanguinello would be to find an independent mutation, an independent blood orange mutation. And uh, we looked and we found one that was reported to be independent, which uh, came from China. And this is called Xinjiang uh, blood orange. It's not really very bloody, and it's not really very nice if you taste it, but, uh, uh, we, but uh, we looked at the, we managed to, I have a Chinese student, he went to Chengdu, and he managed to get a couple of uh, uh, oranges, brought them back, and uh, we analysed it, and this is an independent insertion in the ruby gene, this time it, it's a slightly different retro element, this time it's the other way round, but uh, it seems that this LTR here, this time provides an upstream activating sequence that will direct, uh, uh, from a cryptic uh, tata box, will direct the expression of ruby. And that means that Jinjiang is also cold dependent, so that even the... Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm almost there. So it means that uh, Xinjiang is also, is also cold dependent and cannot uh, provide us with a new source of blood oranges for Brazil and Florida. So uh, this, 
the uh, derivation of the orange of blood oranges seems to be that what well, sweet orange uh, was developed in China around 1100 AD and had arrived in the Mediterranean by the 1400s. You can see this in paintings by Bot Botticelli. They're there. Uh, then at some time, probably before 1646, which is the first written record of blood oranges, uh, uh, then the blood orange mutation had arisen, uh, at least in Italy, and this gave rise to Sanguinelli, uh, to Tarocco, and to Moro. So all of the blood orange varieties that we know and that are famous are all derived from the same event. And uh, we don't know whether this happened in China and then was lost, or whether it happened in the Mediterranean originally, but probably in the Mediterranean. Then in the derivation of sweet orange, uh, there's Valencia, there's Navalina, which was developed in 1800. There's the Shimuti orange, which was developed around 1844. And at some point, and I put it coming off Valencian orange, but uh, it may have been from a slightly different progenitor, the Jinjiang uh, arose as an independent mutation. But uh, the problem with the supply of uh, Sanguinello cannot be solved by independent mutations. So perhaps there's a scope for an environmentally insensitive blood orange by a genetic modification route. And so our conclusion, my conclusions are that uh, common orange uh, uh, has a non-functional uh, regulator of anthocyanin biosynthesis. Insertion of a retro element drives the production of anthocyanins in blood orange. And maybe by changing the promoter of Ruby to a cold insensitive fruit specific promoter, uh, we can get a GM clockwork orange. <laughs> and uh, so here we are. We're, some citrus transformation done uh, in collaboration with Leandro Pena uh, in Valencia, uh, showing that ruby will induce the production of anthocyanins, at least in callus. <laughs> but it takes quite a while to get fruit from transformed citrus. So we're waiting now to see what they look like. And I want to finish with acknowledging Eugenio, who's really taken on this project as his own, though he's shown here making purple tomato pasta, <laughs> but he's quite into colors and Italian stuff, <laughs> and thank all my collaborators. Thank you very much.